Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to introduce our speaker today. So Carl Warkomsky is a biologist that works with black soldier flies, and he has been in the composting sector since 1994. So Carl, welcome. We are so happy to have you here with us this gorgeous Saturday morning. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for that introduction, Kari. I uh, am excited that there's so much enthusiasm surrounding this native species. It is the most exciting aspect of composting and uh, getting rid of food waste that I've ever done my whole life. There's nothing really exciting about watching microbes break down um, your uh, food waste, but something that actually you can see in real time uh, is, is, is adds a lot of excitement. And uh, I think everybody's going to be really uh, pumped about this presentation afterwards. It's, it's a fun uh, aspect of composting that I hope everyone gets to experience. I find it as rewarding as beekeeping. So let me know when you guys are ready and I will start the show. I think we're ready. Okay. Yeah. So we've got some fun. We had some fun answers about our spring sightings, um, pollen came up a lot, <laughs> of course, because it is super polleny out there. And towhees, I did see, and I did see a towhee this morning too. So lots of towhees are out there and dogwoods. Oh my gosh, my dogwoods are gorgeous this year. Everything so, looks gorgeous, it's beautiful. It Can everybody see my screen, the welcome not, page? Nope, not yet. Okay, let me go back. Yes, better. We see that now. All right, so let me go ahead and play this. All right, is it taking up the main part of your screen now? That's perfect, yep. Okay, that's me in the bottom right. Um, I put my information if anybody needs to contact me. What we can do, if people have questions, um, I don't have the ability to see those questions, but um, Kari can ask them as they come in and I'll stop on that slide. If you want to wait to ask your questions till the end, that's absolutely fine. There's no uh, hard line protocol for this. Let's just do whatever you, um, the attendees want and we'll go from there, okay? Um, so black soldier flies, why are we doing this? This is a permaculture farm in Hawaii on one of the wet sides of um, uh, Oahu, which is one of uh, where Honolulu is. And they use our technology there. And this was close to our research facility when we were needing to do studies year round. It's just an incredible farm. There's quite a few of them. Um, okay, so why, why farm insects? Well, the US has a problem um, and we have a lot of it. Um, we have so much food waste in this country. We only are recycling about two to 3% of it. Most of that is going to composting. Some of it goes to feed pigs and other livestock, but the vast majority is going to the landfill. There's a small percentage uh, going to incineration, which doesn't really help the climate. But if you were to look at your garbage, about one fifth of it is food waste. And it takes up that much of the municipal solid waste in America. Um, and we have a problem, we have to do something with it. This recovery hierarchy is kind of a top-down approach to the best uses. Obviously, if we could eliminate the food waste before it happens, that's the best approach. Feed people who are needy, then feed animals, industrial uses, composting, landfill incineration. And we really wanna get as high up in that upside down pyramid as possible. Okay, why are we doing this? Well, it's because food waste has a huge impact and that impact is on the climate. Here in America, we're producing 80 billion pounds a year. That's what we're throwing away. It's about 40% of the entire food supply that we actually produce. It's equivalent to about 219 pounds per person, which is also equal to about 1600. This is 2021. So these are updated statistics. If food waste was its own sovereign nation, it would be third after the China and the US in regards to its impacts on the climate. That's how monumental a problem this is globally. It's not just the US. Yes, we're number one in food waste generation, but it is a global problem. Uh, so what can we do about it? Well, 
we can go up the resource uh, recovery hierarchy and obviously reduce the amount of waste we have. Any waste that is absolutely still viable to divert to people in need. But the next level is to feed animals. Now, what you could do is you could take those food scraps and feed them directly to animals. And you will have that on uh, a lot of the natural pig farms that are not using commodity feed. They're actually feeding food waste right to uh, the pigs. There are some liability issues with that. And um, a lot of the donors like big supermarkets don't allow it because they don't want to get into a situation that could cause a lawsuit. So we could be doing more, but we're not because of the legal barriers. A workaround on this is to transform the food waste into something that can be fed directly to animals. And that is black soldier fly. Those uh, are pre-pupa that you see there on the screen. That is the part that you end up harvesting and can be either fed directly to animals or you could use it to produce some type of insect meal. Now, one of the exciting aspects of this species is its speed of digestion. Yes, you can put this food waste in a compost bin, and that's actually a great place to do it if you have nowhere else to put it. And it will break down over a course of four to four weeks to four months. Um, there, it's not exciting to watch. You can pick up, you can open the top on your compost bin and look at it. It's not gonna change much from day to day, but it does change. This here is the amount of time in hours and minutes in the bottom right that these grubs are digesting uh, are cooked fish on the right, a raw fish on the left. Uh, because it's raw, it takes a little bit more of the digestive enzymes to work on it, but they'll eat it nonetheless. But the speed and the ability of this species to break down food waste and divert it from the landfill is amazing. They have one of the widest digestive enzyme profiles of any insect. And that is absolutely paramount to the success of this species. It, um, they can break down fats, carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, which is everything in food. Now it won't break down wood. It won't break down paper. It won't break down cardboard, but it will do a great job of breaking down everything from your kitchen. And that is an absolute um, benefit. So I just wanted to see people, this isn't even one day of time. And they have basically devoured. Now that bone that you see there that's just floating around, give that a couple more days and the acidity and digestive enzymes will break it down and it will disappear over the course of a couple of days. It just won't disappear right away. It's the same with other bones. Anyway, I wanted to show everybody that fun video. We have a couple of questions already. Um, Absolutely, go the, ahead. The first one is me. And are the white ones that we're seeing, are those the ones that are getting ready to pupate? So the white ones are all of the instars. And when I say instars, they're life cycle stages. And there are stage one through five. And, and Kari, basically they're just different sizes of that little white cream colored grub that you saw. Some are smaller, some are bigger, just depending on their age. Those are the ones that feed. Those are the ones that digest the food waste. Once they change color, they actually don't even have mouth parts anymore. And their whole purpose is to climb somewhere safe and turn into a fly. So once they change color, and that's a great indication that they're ready, they're no longer feeding. When there's still that cream color, that means they're feeding. So that's when you create your own do-it-yourself unit or have one of our pods, that's the color of the grubs in your um, active pile. Very, that's super interesting. And then um, Martha wants to know how many grubs are in there? Um, probably a few thousand, not many. Believe it or not, that wasn't a lot of grubs. Now, it, when you have a big unit, there could be tens of thousands in it. Uh, and their life cycle is really quick. I mean, you can have egg to mature pupa in, in like two and a half weeks. So it's really quick. The life cycles, especially in the Southeast, there's many, many life cycles. Um, but you don't need a lot of them, which is amazing. Um, red worms uh, cannot eat uh, at this speed or volume, even though they are a great composting methodology, they're a lot slower and they can't eat the wide variety of foods. 
Um, but I do um, admire them and wish that they uh, more people had worm bins. This is a little bit uh, more accelerated in speed. Very cool. And Sam says that that was a really cool time lapse. And it, it was. <laughs> it was out of Switzerland. Okay, so bioconversion. What is bioconversion? Bioconversion is taking the food waste and converting it biologically into something else. So what we're doing is we're actually taking the food waste and converting it into a biomass of living critters that then can be used for another purpose. Those, um, that bioconversion, why is it important? Well, if you look at here, if you take 16 square feet, which is just happens to be the size and footprint of our technology, four by four feet, um, that will consume in one year uh, over seven tons of food waste. That's pretty amazing considering um, the, the, the small space. That is the equivalent of producing 414 pounds of protein in that biomass. Now, when you compare that 16 square feet to how much it takes soy for, and that, believe it or not, that is a double planting of soy annually. So that's actually two crops of soy. You get 356 pounds of protein, which is impressive, but that's on a whole acre, not 16 square feet. So think of this, we're not only taking a waste problem and addressing it, we're also saving space and farmland to produce valuable proteins. And it's not just proteins, it's also fat. Um, that diversion of food waste is critical because we're eliminating the anaerobic decay, which forms methane. And uh, that's really impactful for the climate, about 28 to 35 times worse than CO2. Um, the bioconversion rate or how much food waste goes into grub biomass it's about five to one. So a hundred pounds of food waste roughly ends up being 20 pounds of grubs. So that's a good ratio, one to five or five to one, depending on what day of the week it is. Um, so we're going ahead and gonna go further. Anyone have any questions on that? I know it's a little bit overwhelming with the charts, but. So far, so far no, no more questions, but if anybody does have questions, just put them in the chat. So one foot of bioconversion, it tends to not be very deep. We're talking a few inches deep. They tend to feed on the surface. One foot of bioconversion of food waste will produce 35 pounds of protein a year, and you can feed it to a multitude of creatures, um, mostly poultry, uh, aquaculture, and piggeries, little baby pigs. The piglets love grubs, but you can't imagine how much they crevulate over it when you uh, put it near them. Crevulate's a made up word, but it just kind of serves its purpose. Okay. The protein level is really high and they know that. So they find it quite delectable. So crave, salivate, crevulate. It's an amalgamation, made up word. Uh, okay, so the nutritional value, just understand that it's high in fat and protein. You don't really need to know these, but a real good takeaway is that there's a good source of fiber. And for people who have layers or, or chickens that are primarily purposes to lay eggs, they have 5% calcium by weight. And that's absolutely critical for um, high integrity uh, shells. A lot of times, the commodity foods that you buy at the big boxes, they don't have enough calcium and you get thin shells. And uh, it's, it's really important if you don't want to have those eggs break as you're bringing them back in the house. Um, one aspect that they're researching, especially in Hawaii, because they have to import all liquid fuels, is they're growing these grubs on food waste and extracting um, the oils and using it for diesel which is amazing that you can get 40% oil yield or biodiesel out of this. I call it grub diesel. Uh, so it's distinct and distinguished from, let's say, oil from, you know, one of the commodity crops. That is my old business partner, Robert, uh, with his beauty shot. That's our little technology. And uh, I want it, if you can take away one thing from this lecture that really has nothing to do with necessarily just grubs, but it has to do with feeding your, your flock. And most people just go and buy the pellets and that's what they feed them. But 
to give them a balanced diet, just like with us, if we were fed pellets all day, we probably wouldn't have the best digestive uh, tract with microbes and we probably wouldn't be as healthy. But if you can balance their diet and follow the golden rule, which I call the three G's, which is one third grasses and leafy greens, the stuff they find outside in the, in the yard, one third grains and seeds, and that could be everything from sunflower to the seeds from weeds, and then one third grubs and critters. That is a really good recipe to have healthy chickens that are gonna live happy and long-term and um, have a more varied and interesting diet. And I'll tell you right now, if you were to, to prioritize those three things in regards to their interest and love, grubs and critters are at the top. They really go out of their way. My chickens like me because of the grubs. They wouldn't come near me or be interested in me if it wasn't for the grubs. So anyway, I just wanted everybody to have that kind of heritage golden rule of chicken feed. Uh, it goes pretty well with other poultry. Um, okay, so besides feeding poultry, you could also feed aquatics. I would say we get calls from all of these different types of farms around America wanting a big pallet of our technology to take food waste from their local restaurants and transform it into feed. Why do farmers like this? Because they're becoming self-reliant on their feed and they're not having to purchase it. They're taking food waste, usually for free, or the restaurants pay them to take it. So it's a double benefit. They're offsetting their feed costs. Um, every single one of these, everything from the ornamental koi to the tilapia in the top left is um, kind of a subset client of aquaculture. A lot of anglers or fishermen also buy this for fishing, which is a great uh, feed, just like, uh, just a great bait, just like um, uh, worms. But, um, I guess probably the most important and exciting aspect of this aquatic industry is it prevents um, the scouring of the entire oceans of every living thing to turn into fish meal and then feed to um, the fish farms. It actually, the insect meal can replace fish meal and we don't have to scour the ocean for every living thing. So it really helps um, the fisheries to get restore and renew. And that's absolutely critical because without the oceans, we're not going to really have a future and we need to make sure to protect our fisheries. So anyway, I wanted to um, remind everybody that it's not just about offsetting uh, waste from the landfill. It's also about protecting our fisheries. And if anybody wants to pursue any one of these different species like the catfish, just Google black soldier fly and catfish and you can find out like the perfect ratio of feed that is offset. And with catfish, it's for, for example, it's 25%. Now, these are my band people tips. how much the chickens love. They're not Polish. Fresh grubs. And you get an idea. These here are Bantam Polish. And, and they're actually silky. You get a little obsessed, but you can tell they're not disliked. Now there's 5% calcium in this particular species of insect. So it's really good for the layers. The babies were born here. Even little babies get excited. And you don't have to give them much. Almost like a treat in the morning, a treat in the afternoon. Okay, a little bit, 411. Now, Kari and I remember when rotary phones existed and when you could call 411 for information. Does that still exist? Does everybody know what 411 means for information? Is that still a thing or is that like for only old people? Anyway, 411 means information. So I just want to give some people some background information. That's the species, adult species in the top right. Those are the mature pre pupa on the bottom right. Um, Keep in mind that this species is native to the US. So even though it's been globally uh, naturalized around the planet in areas that it's easily to acclimate, it is native to here. And so you'll find 
success here in the Southeast the easiest of probably anywhere on the planet. This is not like a regular house fly. It's not a nuisance. It's not a pest. It's not going to bother you indoors or at picnics. It is a fly, just like house flies, but it is a different species. This particular fly has a very short lifespan. Its real purpose is just to breed. So it doesn't have mouth parts. Because it doesn't have mouth parts and feed, it doesn't really carry germs because its real purpose is just to breed. It doesn't go from food waste to food waste like house flies do. The only time it goes to food waste is to lay eggs. And um, it is, it doesn't look like a fly when you see it. It kind of resembles a wasp. And I think that just has to do with evolutionary mimicry because if you don't want to get eaten by a bird, you probably want to resemble a wasp so that it doesn't uh, uh, eat you immediately. Um, we talked about what it eats. Um, the purpose of the adult is just to breed. It's a baby machine. Um, ironically, and it doesn't do well with other flies. And in fact, when you have a colony of black soldier flies, other flies tend to disappear, whether it's through, out, through competition or through some type of pheromone or maybe a different microbial environment or all three, um, you tend to have less uh, house flies and pest flies like fruit flies when you have a colony, which is great. Um, it is th the quintessential recycler uh, in the environment, kind of like mushrooms. Um, the main life cycle that we see is just the grub. You will rarely see the adult. You will see it occasionally, very rare to breed, to see the breeding, but the primary uh, component of the life cycle that we all see is the grubs in your colonies. Yeah, can't use that. Okay, so here's the entire life cycle from egg to adult. I wanted to people just to see this going clockwise. Um, this takes uh, two weeks, you know, is a good indication, maybe two and a half weeks in the summer. Um, but it's important to know that this is something that just gets larger and larger and larger and larger, and then it pupates. Um, those in the top left are about 10 millimeters, which is about a centimeter. So if anybody wants an indication of size, uh, you'll find this diagram, even though it is our copyright and we had it commissioned, it's all over the internet. So everybody uses it and we love it. Um, those are the five instars I talked to Carrie about, the different larva stages. As it gets closer and closer, those cream colors do darken a bit. So like the ones at the bottom uh, that before they turn into a pre-pupae um, are, are close to the color, but not quite. The color change is very helpful. Those darker ones do not have mouth parts. They do not have digestive tracts. They don't feed anymore. Their purpose is to climb out of the waste and go pupate. So we have a question from the chat. Yeah. So Billy is asking, have you ever encountered an issue with an overpopulation of flies and how do you deal with that? Um, somehow the flies adjust. Uh, yes, you can have too many grubs and when there's not enough food, they tend to be like little minnows in a puddle that don't have enough water. You kind of know because they're on the surface like looking for food, they're, they're everywhere. And so yes, you can have an overabundance, but they tend to adjust to the amount of food waste. It is probably hormonal or microbial in nature. And when there's a lack of food waste, my guess is certain chemicals are produced that tell the pregnant females that have eggs, don't lay eggs here. There's this chemical that signifying there's not a lot of food waste. Move on and go lay your eggs somewhere else. So my guess is that it's chemical in nature, but that's the theory we don't really know. But these colonies seem to adjust. If you have too much food waste, that could be a problem. It's going to take them a couple of days to really ramp up. If you have not enough, you don't see as much egg laying. So it kind of it it kind of um, fluctuates, but they seem to know. Um, but yes, here in the southeast, you will get a lot of egg laying in the warm months. Um, we have another question from yeah. Talitha. So the first year. Um, they started their compost, they got the flies and they're great. And they start taking their parents' scraps as well because they're eating so fast. But then they haven't really come back since the first year. And so you mentioned that they don't eat paper cardboard. So do you think it might be because the mix is browns and greens? 
This is in their compost bin. Mm -hmm, I think so. My guess is they will appear if you use food waste. They don't tend to have an interest in a compost pile that doesn't have fresh or putrescent waste. So if there's no food waste in there, they're really not interested. And yeah, you might find some because there's still pockets of nutrients, but most of decomposing food waste that's turned into compost, there's not as much energy in that compost as there is in the food waste. So they don't tend to find it as interest. So a compost bin that's broken down, you won't find them. So my, my, the solution is add food waste and don't bury it in the center. They'll, they'll come on the surface and make sure it's moist. Um, everybody, here's the adult fly kind of close up so you can see what it looks like. That is probably a male. The, the abdomen of the female is a little pointier. Um, they tend to breed and live up in the tree canopy. You don't see them very often. They'll come into food waste to breed, but they're just not very common. I have a lot of pods running and I, I really don't see them very often. Um, and uh, it's just surprising that you get so many eggs and so, many, so much breeding and you just don't see them very often. Um, they do require light. You can't do this in your basement um, unless you have some type of full spectrum light or special bulbs that you can get online that are for black soldier fly. They really need to be outdoors to do that. And they, they do the mating outside your colony that has nothing to do with us, it's done in nature. Um, when they hatch out, they immediately breed. And then about a week later, they'll lay eggs. That's it, they, that's it. Their life cycle is under two weeks. They, they don't have a long lifespan. That's probably another reason why we don't see many of them because they're such a short lifespan in the adult stage. These are harmless, they don't bite, they don't sting and they don't transmit pathogens. They're not a vector. Um, here's the eggs they lay. I circled them so everyone can see. They could be white, they could be cream, they could be yellow depending on the age. Also depends on you know, like the subspecies where you are in the country. Here, we're lucky. We have two species of soldier fly. We have the black soldier fly and the golden soldier fly. And you'll see both. The golden so soldier fly have small, a little bit smaller grubs and you'll be able to distinguish them. But um, their egg cases are also slightly different color. Um, you can scrape these off and move them if you want to another pile to activate. Just don't dump the eggs onto something wet they seem to get moldy and fungi growth if the eggs are wet. So kind of keep them dry if you do want to uh, move the colonies. Um, unfortunately, all the lizards around like to eat them. Our pods are pretty, um, it's pretty hard for lizards to get in, but when you do it, do it yourself units, they'll go in and eat them. It's unfortunate, but uh, we do have that problem here. Uh, they, they hatch in about 96 hours, four days. That is what I told Kari about the instars one through five. That is instar number five before they pu uh, pupate into that dark colored one. That, that is a ravenous feed uh, engine. Boy, do they consume. Um, and you're not going to have any problem if for some reason you want to feed these to your um, animals. They're just as fine. Um, if you want to harvest them at this level, it's great. Some people actually put pieces of wet bread on top of their pile, active pile, and it attracts all of the juveniles. And then they feed them to like certain ornamental fish or smaller fish that may have smaller mouths that can't handle the larger grubs. So there are uses for the younger grubs outside of just um, food waste diversion. You can actually feed them to your specialty aquatics and specialty herps. A lot of customers we have are aquarium and reptile enthusiastics, also um, amphibian. Um, I'll show you the wiggle. The wiggle is really a signature characteristic of the species. It, it distinguishes it between the maggots of the house fly and these grub is the wiggling undulating um, motion. Uh, if for some reason you wanted to get a huge amount of bounty of this, instead of waiting for them to crawl off as a dark colored one. If you give the pod or you give your colony some heat, uh, the heat stresses them out and they crawl out. 
they want to get out to a cooler environment. And so you'll get all of these harvesting quickly if you add some heat. Uh, that's what they do in the lab. Okay, so I'm gonna click on this so you can see the undulating. It is sort of a smooth undulating, not erratic. And I have a video on the house flies later to show you the larval uh, undulation of the house fly. Anyway, I wanted people to know that that undulation is really key for them to, to, to know that you have black soldier fly. Here, we'll play it again while we review this. Uh, again, this is the pre pupae stage. They don't eat, they don't feed. There's not mouth parts. You can put them in your hand. They're, they're not gonna get bitten. Um, they're all, their whole purpose is to just evacuate the food pile and go off and hide somewhere and pupate. Uh, they are mobile. So these things will crawl. If you have wet surfaces, they will crawl up vertically. Um, they're, but they're really good in this stage at transportable because they tend to be relatively clean and dry. So having this in a bucket is really easy. The portability of this makes it really convenient. And uh, I really like that about the species. Um, okay, so that wiggling- We movie, have a, do we have time? We have another question? We have time for as many questions as we- Awesome. Get. So Caroline has a question, um, so a clarification. So this process is to break down food waste and then use the gross for animal feed. So this does not provide compost for the garden and will in fact reduce your compost mass. Yes, it is not for compost. Uh, out of that 100 pounds of food waste, when we get 20 pounds of uh, uh, grubs, you get about three to five pounds of what I call undigested residue that can be used to make compost. It is not compost by any means. It actually needs to be polished off, whether fed to a worm bin and firm, form vermicastings or put in your actual compost bin to finish off the decomposition process. It's all the stuff that they can't eat. Though so think of like, the lignin in your food waste, like the mango pit or the avocado pit, like that heavy woody stuff that they just don't eat, that stuff will need to be composted down. Um, I noticed they don't eat uh, citrus rinds, uh, thick avocado rinds. So there's certain things they won't eat that still need to be composted and it's not composted at the bottom of the pod. So this species, even though it's called composting, you're not producing compost as you're finished. Even though, I, that's why I like to call it black soldier fly digestion, is it really is a digestion of food waste. It's not a composting of food waste, even though you can get small amounts, but it's not the purpose. The purpose is to create um, black soldier fly biomass. Um, now this particular stage is after that last stage of the wiggling black one, they eventually elongate and stop moving. And so what's happening there, the fly is maturing and eventually will hatch out. But this is their vulnerable stage. They can get eaten by um, like raccoons and stuff. So they tend to be, they tend to bore down into the ground and hide until they're ready to pupate. Um, this is also the version, the, the life cycle that overwinters. So this is what kind of survives over the winter here in North Carolina and hatches out in the spring as soon as the temperatures are amicable. Um, and uh, when you're digging in your garden and you find these that are immobile, that's what that is. Um, that's not uncommon for people to find that. Um, okay, so what uses are good for um, black soldier fly? Obviously we, we talked about the food waste before and how much you can get out of it. We talked about how it reduces methane and diversion from the landfill. We talked about how it feeds chickens and pigs. We do have a lot of people in Europe and South Africa who use it to feed dogs, which is interesting. We don't tend to do that in this country, but it is a good source of protein. Um, and, and, and dogs like pigs are omnivores and so they can definitely eat them. Uh, we talked about the calcium in the layers. We talked about the aquatic species. Um, we had um, that question about compost. Um, the undigested residue that accumulates at the bottom of any active pile can be fed to redworms or any other species of worms and to polish off into vermicompost. And believe it or not, I've talked to worm growers that are commercial. They tell me that the undigested residue from pods 
is actually preferred by redworms. They like it because it's pre-digested. It's all the stuff they don't eat quickly. And it's almost like prepped food for them. So they go at it very quickly. So a lot of people who have black soldier flies seem to also be getting into red worms so that they can finish off and form compost in the form of vermicastings. Um, another question about use. Yes. Um, so can you feed the grubs to songbirds? You know yes. How, yes. Yes. We originally, when we designed our technology, we did it for the purpose of um, addressing the songbird um, migratory routes, which are in danger. And um, you can put them in any bird feeder that is designed for uh, mealworms. So when you go online, you'll see bird feeders that a lot of um, bird enthusiasts used for mealworms. The exact same type of feeder will work with black soldier grubs. And in fact, I apologize for forgetting that. I think I ran out of bullet space. But yes, songbirds are absolutely enthusiastic about these. I don't know if they'll land on your hand and take them out of your hand. They're not quite as tame as chickens, but they are, um, they do relish it. And you know who really likes it too? Ravens and crows, and they're smart. And so they're almost, when they're eating them, they're thinking about what you're doing while you're feeding them. So it's, it's kind of creepy, but they're really smart birds, uh, both ravens and crows. We talked about the crude fat formed by diesel. In Europe, not so much here, and then Southeast Asia, um, they're raising black soldier flies for human consumption or entomophagy. I have eaten them before. I've gone to a potluck that only allowed dishes made with them. You could not go to the potluck unless the dish was black soldier fly. And it was, an, it was a great dinner. They, it kind of tastes like a tasty chicken. So it's you know great. that I plan bug fest, Carl, of course, and we're always yeah. looking for new species to feed people um, as we uh, teach about entomophagy and the benefits of eating lower on the food chain. Food chain. Um, so when you prepare black soldier grubs, are, do, are you preparing them whole? Are you making them into, are you grinding them out? Like how do you, what, what's the typical method? You can do all of the above. You can form a meal like crickets into meal. Um, you can uh, saute them. Uh, most of the ones that I have tasted and eaten, they were in whole, they were whole or chopped slightly and sauteed usually like to stir fry. There are some people who bake with them so that they get the protein. Uh, but um, I haven't done that person. I've only eaten it. I, I can't taste it. It's just like part of the, the food. But with um, the stir fry, you can see them and taste them. They, I think they don't taste much different than earthworms. I believe if you want to do this here in the States for human consumption, go through the protocols of what you're to feed them. I mean, I wouldn't eat anything that I fed spoiled food waste and then put those raw in my mouth. They're hygiene ish issues. You just don't want to get sick. So I would never ever recommend not cooking these. So they have to be cooked thoroughly, just like any type of raw. Uh, food. Um, but you may want to um, look at the different types of feed that you can give them to alter the taste. And that's all online. We don't have a, a, re a recommendation or reference to that, but you can find it online to kind of tweak the taste. We did have somebody do that for Bug Fest one year. They request, one of the restaurants requested their crickets live and then they um, fed them like the spices <laughs> before they prepared them. So wow. I will say this, keep in mind those, the dark colored ones, they no longer have mouth parts. So if you put them in cornmeal, they're not going to eat it. So you would have to target the last instar of the life cycle, those large cream color grubs. You could polish that off with some type of, like you said, herbs and nutrients and spices, and then have it uh, reflected in, in the finished product. But don't eat these raw people. You could get sick because your food waste is probably contaminated. Uh, let's see here. Okay, this is what everybody seems to love. How you start a colony? Well, first of all, this is a native species. If you have food waste and you put it outside, you're almost guaranteed to get these. You're also gonna get other things like raccoons and house flies, but you'll probably get black soldier flies in the Southeast. Um, I wanted to just go over quick cultivation. People ask me these common questions. Yes, you could do this 
indoors in a climate controlled setting like a greenhouse, but it's a lot of work. Just like you could grow tomatoes year round in a greenhouse. It's just a lot of work. I always tell people just do it seasonally outdoors like you would peppers and tomatoes. It's the same season, basically uh, April to November. And uh, it, it's all predicated on the last hard frost. If the last hard frost is in October, you're really not gonna get much more activity. But if it goes all the way to November, and I had them go almost all the way up to Thanksgiving on warmer years, you're going to extend the season a little bit. So I'll talk about where the zones are. Here in Raleigh area, we're usually between seven and eight, somewhere in there. Perfect, perfect climate for this. So most people who are listening have no problem. Up in the mountains in the higher altitudes, you may have sporadic coverage. That doesn't mean you won't find them. You just may have a lower um, population density. Um, people ask me when, I always tell them when the, when the temperatures outside are over 75, you're gonna get hatching and egg laying. Usually if it's below that and it's already gone over that here, uh, you're not gonna get hatching and egg laying. But right now, if it's forward full throttle, you can have a colony starting now. Um, in fact, I always spend late March getting everything ready. Um, they do need light, as I said before, to mate, but also for egg production. There's certain bandwidths of the UVB spectrum that are helpful for egg maturation, egg production. It's just really interesting, the dynamics of how things happen when it comes to eggs. Um, they are attracted to putrescent waste or the smell of ripe, slightly decomposing foods, not anaerobic foods, but kind of aerobically decomposing foods. Um, actually they do, they are attracted to anaerobic foods too, but more so ripe foods, like ripe bananas and melons. They like the humid, humidity here. Um, people who produce these, they wanna know what they're gonna do like in the cold months. I said, just freeze it or dehydrate them so you have grubs in the winter. Uh, they're not gonna save. You can save them at wine cooler temperatures, which is around 50 to 55, um, if you want to save them alive. That is a really good way to do it if, for those of you who have wine coolers. Um, we talked about the undigested residue, which is the buildup at the bottom. Um, it kind of resembles baby poo. Um, and It's very pasty. That gets fed to worms. Do not ever do your colonies here in the southeast in sun. They have to be in full shade and it needs to stay moist. Don't let them desiccate. Uh, the digestive activity doesn't work well in dried pods or dried colonies. Okay, I talked about zones. So we all know where Raleigh is. Maybe um, Kari can just kind of put the cursor over the Raleigh area. I don't have the ability to do that. Uh, but it's that county that's kind of pink in seven, even though with climate change, we're really seven B eight. But I have people in Ohio and Michigan reporting that they have black shoulder fly na natively in their area. So we're good here, but if anybody decides they want to move, move out, you're not gonna get black shoulder fly naturally in the green areas. Red, I'm sorry, um, pink, yes. Yellow sporadically, so you'll have cover here and there, but not everywhere, um, mostly in the microclimates, but not green or purple or uh, orange, you're not going to get them in the cold zones. So there are limitations here. You can also get in the hotter zones. So all the way down to the tropics in Southern Florida, you can have grubs. Um, we talked about the temperatures. Um, optimal is about 75 to 105. I would, you can have activity of the grubs down in the air temperature can be in the fifties and they'll still be active because they generate a lot of exothermic heat themselves. So even though the air temperature is cold, you put your hand in the pot and it's like in the nineties because they're so, um, they have such high digestive um, activity. They actually heat up their own environment. Um, and because of that, you have to keep them in shade. You don't want any more heat than is naturally being produced in the colony. I do not recommend putting lids or covers on these because you could heat it up excessively and you can suffocate them. So these are just open to the environment. I know that sounds illogical, but they have to be protected from rain. I have mine underneath like my barn lean-tos. I also have them underneath lean-tos from my shed. Um, also, I have some under um, a canopy, or not a canopy, um, an arbor for grapes that doesn't get a lot of rainfall. So they are protected from sun and from rain. If you don't have 
any ability to protect from rain and sun, you could message me offline and I'll show you how to build a lid that won't impact uh, aeration or heat retention. It's just, you basically just need to do an elevated cover. Um, let's see here. When it, temperatures in the fall start to get below 70, uh, regularly you're gonna not have any more egg laying and the colony will only continue on for the grubs that are there and they're not gonna have any more adults coming in. Um, again, if you wanna save live larvae because you have specialty animals, you can save them at wine cooler temps and little uh, cups that have um, perforations so they can uh, breathe. Uh, quick tips, if you get cream colored larvae in your bin, uh, it's too hot. You can take them out and dump them back in and they'll mature and then crawl off when they're ready. But premature crawl off and having mixed colors and mixed ages in your bucket means it's too hot. Uh, if you have all of these, what looks like suffering lethargic grubs on the top of the pile, and they're all out, they're trying to cool down, it's too hot. Um, when you find dead grubs, it's because the temperature probably went over 110. 110 is, is lethal to the species and it's parking lot temperatures. And we all know how hot it gets in that asphalt. But um, the solution is I use those reusable frozen gel packs or the plastic gel packs that you put in like your coolers. And I have them always uh, ready to throw in. I just dump one or two of those in. Those bring down the temperature really quick in the active pile. Um, and then they're reusable. You just have to clean them off. Um, I also monitor the outside of my pod with, if you've ever seen those aquarium thermometers that you can actually stick on your uh, aquarium, you can actually stick them on the outside of your active pile. The, the aquarium ones don't go up high enough in temperature and low enough down, but the um, the reptile thermometers that are the liquid flat ones do, and they have a wider range of like down to 65 up to like 115. Um, so you look for those thermometers if you want to get, they're like $2. Um, okay, how to start up. I always start with one main ingredient for my substrate, and that's either coffee grounds or brewer's mash. Both work great. Both serve uh, an invaluable purpose for startup. And I would suggest just go into your coffee shop. They'll give you as much as you want. Just be careful what you ask for because sometimes it's a lot. I start off with five gallons, one of those five gallon pails from like Home Depot or Lowe's. I fill the entire thing with coffee grounds. And I dump that entire thing in, for, in my pod for new setup. Um, what I do for my, my secret recipe, I call it, I mix in moist coffee grounds or brewer's mash. And brewer's mash is just, um, the leftovers brewer's waste after brewing beer. Um, I put in pet kibble that's just kind of old and I soak it for an hour and I mix that in with the coffee grounds. If I don't have any pet kibble, I put some banana peels or overripe fruits and melons that have an odor. The, the adult flies really like that and they're attracted to it. They really like bread. So I was getting food waste from a bakery um, I like it because it doesn't weigh anything. You have an entire bag of it that's like five pounds. And all you have to do is soak it in some four gallon, uh, five gallon pails for like an hour. And it just gets all mushy and, and lumpy like oatmeal. And I take all that bread waste and I just dump it in. That's a great startup, uh, startup food. And leftover pasta kind of equally works as well as breads. And then if you have corn cobs, that fermented smell of just soaking that in some water in a sunny bucket for a couple days, it starts to stink. They seem to like that. It also works well with cornmeal. So like soured, uh, the smell of that is really attractive to the females. Um, be careful about leaving your, if you have a black soldier fly colony and you have a, like a lot of chicken feed out or other types of animal feeds, make sure it's covered because if that gets wet, Yes, you can get fungal growth on the feed, but the black soldier flies start laying eggs in your feed. And all of a sudden you open up your feed and it's all black soldier flies. They'll eat, they'll eat your animal feed. Um, I always notice on the startup units, right about when I've just gotten frustrated and I haven't seen anything, that's about when uh, the two week level hits. And I just, a few days after that, I start seeing activity. 
Now, how do I know when there's activity? Well, I always put the coffee grounds and, and food waste into like a, a small volcano pile. And when that volcano levels off to completely flat, I know that they're active because they actually physically moved that pile in, and spread it out horizontally. So that's like my secret when I set up a new unit and I don't keep monitoring it. I go back and there's no more volcano pile. I know that they're in there. And it's usually at around two, two and a half weeks. Um, there are always uh, fruit flies and house flies that initially uh, find your food waste. They disappear after usually week three or four when the black soldier fly take over. They just, they don't stay around. I think it's chemical. We really don't know for sure. It could be microbial, but it is, it is an environment that they find inhospitable and the black soldier fly tend to be the only species in there uh, for the rest of the active year. You'll once in a while get a few other beneficials like be beetles and a couple mites, but they don't hurt anything. Um, we talked about the substrate, coffee grounds or brewer's mash. I can't tell people enough not to use shredded cardboard or use shredded leaves or lose dirt from the garden. Don't use any of that. Use a waste that is absolutely perfect and ideal for a colony. Why are those things good? Well, they're good because they hold moisture and stay moist, but they don't soak it up and get goopy. So there's always oxygen and airflow that can go through the pores of uh, both coffee grounds and brewer's mash. The porosity is critical for oxygen to get into uh, uh, the pile. It holds moisture, like I said, too much liquid and it just drains through. It also blocks light and they really don't like to be light. If you're a small grub that's probably attractive to a bird or a raccoon, you probably don't want to be out in the open. You probably want to be hot, hidden. And so you probably don't like light because light reveals your location. So they don't like it. If you were to scrape your colony within a few seconds, uh, they're all bore back down into it. And I have a video of that to show you really quickly. Um, I didn't mean serve as a refuse. I meant serve as a refuge. So a lot of people who just feed uh, their colonies food waste. Okay, what happens when every drop of food waste is gone? You just have like this giant pass pa uh, pile of living grubs that are just wiggling around. They're exposed. They have nowhere to hide. This coffee ground and brewer's mash, even though they do eat it at a slower rate, serves as a place, a refuge for them to hide. So not a refuse, refuge. This is what happens when you don't edit a document. Um, and of course, like I said before, these uh, substrates are partially edible and they do get eaten over time. That's why you do have to add more coffee grounds every couple of weeks. Again, don't use paper, cardboard, wood chips. They're not going to eat it, and it tends to gump up and form anaerobic pockets, which can cause a stink. Okay, the most important thing of managing your colony, have drainage holes. Don't let water pool. There's nothing that stinks more than having food waste sitting in a puddle in the summer in the southeast. It will stink up to high heaven. So you never want to have liquid pooling in your pot. So have drainage holes and have substrates that don't hold water. Um, and it's not difficult. Just drill holes in your, in your do-it-yourself unit. Our units are designed to uh, drain quickly. And the protocols that we have put in place really do a good job for that. Um, don't think that moisture is bad because desiccation is actually equally bad. So you want it moist, you just don't want it soaking. So don't think that adding moisture is gonna cause pooling liquids. If you have drainage, you can add liquids. It'll drain out naturally, but make sure you have drainage. Um, the reason why we want drainage is we want to prevent those anaerobic conditions from happening. Anaerobic conditions mean conditions without oxygen. That's what causes stink. Those microbes that start breaking down the food without oxygen produce foul odors. If you detect foul odors, something stinks in suburbia. There's something amiss. You don't want to go any further until you address it. It means number one, your drainage holes are clogged and liquid is starting to build up and pool, or 
you have clumpy pockets of food waste that is not getting oxygen. I go in with one of those little hippie claws that are like those plastic three, three fingered claws and I break up any clumps that I find. I used to take a lot of food waste from Chinese restaurants. That kind of forms these goopy masses like the size of softballs that just are pockets of anaerobic conditions. You have to mix that stuff in and break it up or it can form smelly pockets of, of stink. So again, the solution is to make sure you have drainage and make sure you break up your clumps of food waste so that nothing goes anaerobic. The solution to all of this is actually air or oxygen. The, the, the microbes don't do well exposed to oxygen. So if you break up the clumps and expose it to oxygen, the smell tends to dissipate quickly. Um, if there's too much moisture and you think the entire thing like looks like soup and it won't drain, you can resort to just adding dried coffee grounds, which is kind of fresh coffee grounds that you haven't moistened, just add that. That'll soak up a lot of the liquid and increase the porosity and airflow. Um, if it's too dry, just add water to your food waste that you're gonna dump in, or just take your hose and spray it throughout the inside of your active pile. If you have a choice, don't use tap water because of the chlorine. Let the tap water sit maybe for a day or two in a bucket or use well water or rainwater because it doesn't have the chlorines and chloramines and other things that our municipal water has. The reason I say this is microbes don't like chlorine. That's why we use it in the water. And so if you do have the ability to let water sit and you're not in a hurry, do uh, <laughs> utilize that type of water. Pond water is fine too, or, or creek water. Tap water is just not ideal. I just wanted to remind everybody. It's kind of like you're, if you, for those who've had aquariums, you don't want to use tap water that's not treated. Okay, your active pile's going <clears throat> nonstop gangbusters. I always want to have a little blanket right on top of the food waste pile. It's not over your colony. It's just on top of the food waste and it's touching it. And use burlap or jute works the best. This isn't something that is hard to find. You can get rolls of this at most of the garden centers. You do have to keep it dry. So if your pod looks very desiccated and dry, take the burlap off, then wet it, then put the burlap on. Don't wet the burlap because it will start to break down the burlap. And the flies, believe it or not, love to lay eggs on the burlap. Um, and if you all of a sudden wet it, you could actually cause fungal growth uh, on the egg cases and you don't want that. Um, so besides providing a great source of egg laying surfaces, and keep in mind this species of fly likes to lay eggs on adjacent surfaces. They don't tend to lay eggs on the food waste. So they're gonna lay it on the burlap, whereas house flies prefer to lay eggs directly on the food waste. So if all of a sudden you've covered the food waste with burlap, the house flies get a little persnickety and they can't get in and they can't lay eggs as readily as if the food waste is just exposed. So this actually helps by cutting down on uh, the filth flies in addition to the activity of the grubs themselves doing it. Um, that's why I always recommend on setups to use burlap because remember there's no grubs in a newly set up pile. And so the burlap helps cut down on those house flies from laying eggs. Um, it also reduces light. It also helps keep the pod here in the Southeast during the summer from overly drying out. And then I find that I would have to replace this maybe once or twice a year because it gets goopy and starts to break down. Um, I just throw it in the compost pile. Oh, here's what I talked about earlier about that undulation of house fly larva. And notice, this housefly larva crawled out because they'll do an instinctual crawl out. They're not a different color. They actually, at their crawl off stage, are still cream color. Now watch the wiggle. See how it's erratic and jerky? That's how you know that's housefly larva. And they're smaller. And they have that little dark beak on them. So anyway, we'll watch it one more time. That's houseflies. Everybody remembers the undulating elegant wiggle of the black soldier fly grubs. This is definitely erratic, like they had too much coffee. Um, so okay. I have a question about terminology, Carl. So yeah. 
so we're calling these grubs. Why aren't we calling them maggots? I thought that uh, fly uh, larvae were maggots. Biologically, they are maggots. It is a marketing terminology so that okay. people don't throw up in their mouth. I've had okay. so many people throw up at our booths by seeing these colonies. And we, we, we always take the vomit and feed it to the grubs. So we don't, we're not wasting stuff. But I felt that the word maggot has a guttural reaction with so many people that they're already just done with the discussion. So we found that if you just say grubs, which are re really beetle larvae, Right. It's less instinctually nauseating. So it's a marketing thing. These are actually maggots. Okay. Thank it, you for clarifying for yes, me. Yes, it's, it's, it, you are actually correct. They are maggots. But I just don't like saying that to people because they get turned off, which is understandable. Have that reaction. Yeah. yeah. Until, um, except we had that program at Bugfest about the maggots that, um, you know, that are uh, therapeutic that will eat like gangrenous skin, I mean, or flesh, you know, and, and like clean wounds. And so they are here, those are hero maggots. They are. Um, we're changing the world. We're making, we're, we're changing people's minds about these animals. It is, and there's, they have so much benefits. Even, even the lowly housefly can have benefits like um, with uh, uh, necrotic tissue. So, and I'm not sure the species that they utilize, for I'm the trying to remember, species. but it's it's it's, it's, it's probably a specific species. Oh, it is absolutely a specific. And um, they they have so many benefits. Um, so the precautionary principle is just being cognizant of any potential hazards you have with the pot. So you've taken food waste that you've collected from yourself that probably sat out for a couple of days, or you grabbed it from a hotel or a restaurant or an eatery or a cafe. There could be raw mixed in things. There could be rotten foods. There are probably germs. Don't put your hand in there if you have open wounds. Put a glove on, you know, just the, the latex or the neoprene gloves, it's fine. Just be cognizant of the fact that you can actually get an infection if you put your hand in actively decomposing food waste that has germs. The same could be said of the pod because the pod is where you put um, the food waste. The, the, the grub bins, are, these are bioconversion technologies. They're not sanitizers. This isn't the microwave that's gonna sterilize your sponge. So it's something that you have to understand could potentially make you sick or um, infect an open wound. Kind of like you know with having chickens or other things. You just have to be um, alert to any time you raise any animals of any nature. Um, again, if there's a foul odor, chances are it is an anaerobic. There's pockets that need to be fluffed up and broken up, and that will usually solve the problem. Now, everybody has to understand that many insect species have a signature odor. Bees, whoever raised honeybees, there are signature odors associated with bees. They're not foul smells, they're just signature odors. Black soldier fly has a signature odor. It's not a bad smell, it's just an odor that's unique and indicative of this species. You will learn that odor and you will know you have an active black soldier fly colony when you detect that odor. Um, it's not a bad smell. It's just their smell. I actually think it's probably the one of the reasons why you don't have other flies inhabiting coming in is because of that odor. It's just a guess. Uh, I don't know scientifically if that's correct. Um, one thing about storing food waste, you want to store it so that there's um, it's not suffocated. If you suffocate food waste and, and store it outside for like a couple of days, it's going to stink because you're not letting oxygen in there. Just remember oxygen is the solution to stink. Um, and try not to seal it up in bags and stuff that are not exposed. Obviously there's a balancing act between having it exposed so that every critter can get in versus having it completely sealed and stink. So I try to tell people just use the food waste as quick as you can. So it's not sitting around because it will smell if you contain it in sealed bags or buckets. Um, and remember these other species could harbor germs. So you don't really want them around like the house flies, not black soldier flies, but other species. And if you're doing it wrong, you could get those other species. Um, Caroline has a question. Yeah. Um, Will the grubs eat meat and fat? Yes, they will eat both of them and they'll eat it quickly. 
Uh, I have not had a problem eating anything. What they won't eat, Carolyn, is hard mammalian bones don't get eaten. They will digest over time. It might take weeks to months and they will break down in the acidic environment, but they won't eat it. So I found that fish bones and like poultry bones tend to disappear really quick. I don't think they're eating the bones. I just think it's digesting down with their enzymes and eventually they'll consume it. But mammal bones, you will find at the end of the year. So they'll eat all the meat, they'll eat all the bone marrow, they'll eat all the cartilage and all the other soft tissues around it, the mesentery, but they won't eat the bone um, on, the, on the, you know, the large mammal bones. I, I find them uh, at the end of the season. Um, Cause you know, friends like, oh, Carl has a pod. Let's bring the roadkill that was in front of our house over. So, you know, you'll find a skeleton or maybe like a skull at the end of the year. Um, and you know, it's funny, a lot of taxidermists buy these because they wanna clean their skeletons and they use grubs to do it, which I think is an amazing, you know, you're not using chemicals and all that does acids washes that all just go down into the drain. They're using a natural process to clean their bones for their um, artwork. And I think it's just an amazing way to utilize uh, something in nature to, to do that for an industry. Um, we have a few more questions. And I just absolutely. want to say we use dermested beetles at the museum to clean our bones. What, um, what, what kind of beetle? Dermested. And so those are our bone cleaners. We actually have an exhibit on the second floor of the NRC in the um, biodiversity research labs window. And we always have something, they're always in there cleaning something cool. Um, they were doing a, I think they were doing a dolphin skull. It's been a long time since I've been at the museum, but there's some cool stuff. But Kristen has a question. Is the odor of the black soldier fly colony strong enough to make neighbors or an HOA unhappy? Only if you let it go anaerobic and starts to stink. The actual signature odor of the species is not a foul odor, it's just indicative. You know how like some of your friends have like signature odors? It's kind of like that. They're not necessarily bad smells and they're not gonna detest, you know, no one's gonna be detested by it. No one's gonna be uh, repulsed by it. Um, but if it goes anaerobic and you neglect it and there's pockets of foul breakdown, yes, you could upset your neighbors. Um, Did you say another question? Oh yeah, so Nancy has a question. So yeah. with red wigglers, um, they've read that it's best to freeze and thaw food waste. Would it be better to use this principle to avoid bacterial and fungal growth? So bacteria and fungi don't die when you freeze them. It's a misnomer. It, they actually just go dormant. They'll, they're still there. Um, what it does is when you freeze anything that has liquid in it, when water freezes, it takes up one tenth the volume more than it does when it's liquid. So when ice, when water becomes ice, its uh, volume increases by one tenth it's, and it becomes less dense. That's why icebergs float. They're actually one tenth bigger than the water volume. Uh, so that's why, you know, because they're less dense, they float. Um, when you freeze food waste, you break up all the cell membranes, like the cellulose wall, the cellulosic walls that um, are kind of the protector fibers of plants because you, they break up and blow open the digestive ability for the worms and the grubs is faster. So that tends to be why frozen foods get digested and consumed quickly. It's not necessarily a bacteria. Now, yes, if you put them in the freezer, they're not going to continue to grow. So it, it, a lot of people who don't want to let the food waste on the counter start to stink, they freeze it. But it's not necessarily because they wanna kill microbes, it's because they wanna arrest development of additional microbes, or they wanna blow up the matrix of the cellulose, cellulose and lignin fibers that kind of have all the, 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 the juice and nutrients inside the cell walls. So those are the things that could be beneficial. I know a lot of people that freeze their food waste because they don't want flies on their counter and they don't want their food waste on the counter, they just throw it in a freezer bin. It's absolutely fine. Keep in mind though, I would let it thaw before I feed it because frozen, you're gonna bring down the temperature and collapse the temperature of the active pile very quickly and they become sluggish. So let it, let it warm up. Um, 
Uh, other questions, Kari? Nope, that was it for now. Okay, again, tips. Use a substrate. Don't let these little things have uh, uh, no place, no refuge when they've eaten all the food waste. Um, if you have a choice of food waste, they're not gonna get huge and grow and be active if you feed them celery and cilantro, okay? Give them mixed waste. The more calories, the better. You'd be so surprised at how much they love like unhealthy American diets, like with all the calories, like the fats and carbohydrates. They do fine. I, I would say that I have not found foods other than like bones and seeds uh, that they won't eat. They won't eat things like oyster shells, macadamia and like almond nut shells. So they're not gonna eat some of the high lignin or heavy duty stuff. They won't eat citrus rinds. I think it has to do with the terpenes. There's a lot of chemicals that we use from citrus rinds that are for cleaning. And I think they're kind of toxic to a lot of insects. That's why they, I guess we use them in cleaners. Um, don't overfeed, make sure the food's consumed in at least 36 to 48 hours. Um, if your food's like, don't throw a whole watermelon in people, please chop it up. You know, it's going to do so much better if you break it up so that it can access the food waste. I, um, I have friends that bring food waste over because they get it somehow. And it's like giant melons and cantaloupes. I'm just like, dude, break those up before you dump it in there. You got it. You got to let the grubs have like some type of hope to get into the melons. It's just throwing a melon in there. It's going to be really problematic. So chop up large stuff. And if it's, if it's dry, um, moisten it. Um, we had said before, make sure liquids always drain. The pre-pupae change color when they are ready to um, self-harvest. Um, and again, they stop eating when they've turned color. So that's a good indication that uh, there's no more feeding. Oops. Did we go the wrong way? There we go. Okay. So here's just a bucket of recent harvest. It just allows people to see how dry it is, how clean they are. That's basically what you find in the morning uh, in the bucket underneath your pod. And you, everybody saw that wiggle too. It's not the erratic wiggle. Oh, this is, remember I told you that they don't like light? This is just a bowl. It, this is coffee grounds and it's just a bowl of grubs. I think it's long enough to show that they go back in. I think this is the video. Maybe this isn't it. If you were to stay there for about 30 seconds, they all bore down in and disappear. So that was the key purpose of this video that didn't highlight that key purpose. Here's our technology. Oh, yeah. oh th this is actually a very relevant question. Um, so Nancy is asking, she looked at some commercial pods and they seem to be a bit pricey. So what do you recommend to use as a DIY pod? And it looks like you're getting ready to answer that. These are twice as much as they should be because we make them in the US. If we made them in China, they would be about half the price but because we make them here in North Carolina with uh, living wage labor and um, the cost of production is extremely high. And these are handmade. Like if you saw how long it takes, you would basically ask, Carl, how do you actually turn a profit? <laughs> it's not easy. Our margins are really low, but the time involved with making all of these parts by hand is very labor intensive and it's not done by robotics. The only thing that's done by machinery is the, the part is actually rotomolded and then you have to do all of the prep work after. So it is a process and that's why it's expensive. It's because it's all kind of handmade. We, we tried to research and develop a unit like cheaply that could be um, injection molding and stamped out again and again and again, but they didn't perform adequately. So we didn't pursue doing that. Uh, uh, injection molding are like, you know, all those Rubbermaid bins at the store, those are all injection molded and they just, uh, or blow molded, they just get stamped one, one, one after another. Um, maybe in the future, we'll come up with an affordable one that has the features we want 
We just didn't like their performance on the test units we did. So we have expensive units. The good thing is because people who are listening to this video and people who are local, they get the family, friends and family price. So don't think that you have to pay the, the retail price. Just contact directly and say, hey, I'm a local. Uh, can I have the discount, please? And we'll, we'll honor it to you as long as you know, you're not calling from Juneau, Alaska. Um, and yes, so it, the, the local friends and family price is actually doable because there's no shipping too. So it's really, really a good price. Um, these smaller units come with everything you need too. So these aren't do-it-yourself units. Um, they have the ramps for auto crawl off, which is the real key thing. There's the slit. It goes down into the bucket. Um, they'll eat about five pounds of food waste a day and feed a tiny flock. This is good for small people. This is about two feet from, uh, on the long dimension. So about 26 inches if people are trying to get an idea. Uh, this is a pod that I had, uh, I had just fed it. And you saw a black shoulder fly. And that's an active colony. And there's, you just find the grubs in, in the morning and you take that and feed them to a chicken. So it's kind of very auto. Uh, you do have to clean it out every year. But basically food waste goes in, grubs came out. You just have to make sure it's moist and, you know, take the precautionary, uh, um, practices if you detect odor. Um, here's the big one. This is four feet across. It's the equivalent of five of those baby ones. We also make these here in North Carolina. Believe it or not, from a cost standpoint, even though the retail price is more, they're actually a more affordable unit. So farmers and homesteaders buy this one. They never buy the small one. The small one is really for a lot of people who have you know, like urban settings and want to put it on their porch and don't have a lot of room. This is actually the one that makes the most sense because it's so affordable uh, for what you get out of it. You can give an entire bucket of food waste a day, even though I sometimes go up to three or four buckets of food waste a day, which I don't recommend to most people. I just know what I'm doing, but you can actually feed them quite a bit every single day and they will eat it down. You'll actually think that people are stealing your food waste overnight. So I didn't believe that they were actually eating it. I had to set up a time-lapse photography when we first were testing these because I couldn't believe that the food waste was being eaten by grubs. I thought some critter was coming in and eating on my food waste. Then I did time-lapse when I was asleep and sure enough, they're eating it. It was amazing. I was, I was that skeptical because I was like, where are all these food waste going? This is ridiculous. No grub is eating them this quickly. They're like piranhas that don't bite. It's, it's amazing. Um, we, um, if everybody knows Pittsburgh, that's where our factory is. It's a great place to go visit if no one's ever been to Pittsburgh. Um, we let you pick these up right at the factory. You just have to give us a heads up and we do have local pricing. We just ask that um, those pricing that you pay, you don't reveal online in the chat rooms what you pay because they're much, much lower than retail. We just do it as a courtesy for locals. And because we want people to, um, you know, not have a financial barrier and, we're one of those companies that has more of a, per our, our primary purpose is not just profit, but it's also uh, conservation and the community. So you, you just have to balance those out. Um, so Judith has a question. Do you think that they could be computer printed? Um, I don't know. The printer would need to be large. Um, it, the, you know, like those big CNC printers that like for routing for wood. I mean, it would probably have to be like that. And those costs, I mean, we've looked at them, they're about $20,000 for a good machine. And you have to pay for the resin, you know, which is the, the input. Um, I don't know if it would be cost effective. I don't know. I think on smaller parts and, and really detailed materials, 3D printing makes a lot of sense, but on a high volume, such a large four foot unit across, I think the roto molding makes the most. Now, roto molding, can I go back on this? Okay, so these here, because they're not injection molding, these will actually last a lifetime. These are um, made the same way kayaks are made, if anyone's curious about the molding process. They, we can only make seven a day. That's how slow it is. <laughs> so it's, sometimes we can do a dozen, but it, 
not everybody wants to work 16 hour days. So um, seven is normally the limit. Um, but yeah, I, so we, we looked into 3D printing. It just, it didn't make sense financially. The units became actually more expensive. But you know what, for small things, it's great. It makes sense. Um, I just, not for something so big uh, and bulky. Here's a quick video of my pod. So that's that lid shade, I talked about I say, that I don't shade. recommend people There's using a lid. Grounds I use for a but it's shade. elevated There's a couple the inches above. It collects the grubs. Some have harvested off since I dumped it. Here is my makeshift lid because my area. Did, did everyone see my little hippie claw? There's my hippie claw. It's to break up clumps that may stink. Because my area is not. Remember, I mentioned the bread waste I get. Protected from rain. Literally, that was a garbage a bag. Hours ago, they're bread just waste. discarded bread. You can see the grubs climbing up the ramp. And here, I'll claw in so you can see the density of grubs. You it's cannot imagine how insane. much life there is in these piles. It, it just, it astounds me every day that this actually happens. I'm skeptical of everything. And when I some was first introduced to this technology, I'm just like, no way is this going to happen. Chickens. And it's just, it's so much fun and enjoyable. It's as enjoyable as beekeeping. Um, yeah, right, I don't have the best check to see. We got some grubs. Here is the pod that's at my house. So remember how I said everything goes horizontal and there's no more piles? That bread would all go horizontal like this after a day or two. It just gets the engulfed. substrate is coffee grounds, and we simply put the food scraps on top. And they devour them about 24 hours. It's pretty impressive. Anyway, I just wanted people to see. See how they're disappearing really around. quick? And they're, they're, that was an example of them disappearing really quick after they're exposed. Now, keep in mind, I normally have a piece of burlap right on top of this pod. I just, for, for photography purposes, took it off. So it's not on there. But there's normally a piece of burlap right here. Uh, let's see here wanted to show people harvest from the pod. There's quite a bit of grubs in there and several pounds. Um, these auto harvest out of the unit automatically and uh, you don't have to separate. It's a real time saver. And uh, just wanted to show people uh, today's bounty. I don't think I would pursue this at the level I do if they didn't auto crawl off because it would be a lot of work to separate these, kind of like redworms. It's a lot of work to separate them from the castings. I am a lazy gardener and I have things to do like plant peppers and steak tomatoes. I don't have time to separate grubs. I like the fact that the grubs utilize our technology to actually harvest it off. And we, we did two years of ramp research. So we think we have it about right. And we're very proud of that factor. And yes, um, some Chinese companies have copied that ramp technology and gone around the patent. What can you do? You know, you just smile and say, okay, <laughs> there are other units on the market. Um, oh, here, my friend uh, from Colorado was visiting and did some really cool videos here of the ramps close up. See the little beneficial mites there? The grubs don't know where they're going. They just fall down. Jacob was his name. He, um, Jacob came to visit. He was a guy who was working for a, a year round greenhouse an aquaponic greenhouse in Colorado that was putting our pods in the greenhouse with the, the fish and plants. So, because the climate for greenhouse was pretty good and similar to uh, grub cultivation. They were just letting them fly around as part of the in, in, indoor environment. And they were doing it year round. It's Jacob and his other in, kind of commercial growing of grubs is the reason why we have some drainage features on the, on the pod now that are built in. Most people don't use it, but the commercial people do. And it's just part of all the technology now. So if anyone ever wants to do it year round, they can connect 
the bottom part of our pod to any standard drainage uh, fixtures from Lowe's or Home Depot and collect all the liquids and not have it just drain into the mulch below. So that's an exciting new uh, feature. It's just not relevant to outdoor cultivation. So we have a question. So we're, we're getting kind of close on our time, Carl. I wanted to let you know that. And then um, Nancy has a question about the coffee grounds. So yeah, do, they, do they consume the coffee grounds? And if they do, does the caffeine affect them in any way? You know what? We haven't found that it does, but people have told me who have been doing this for years with coffee grounds, it somehow makes them a little bit different. They tend to be a little bit more sluggish. I have not noticed it. You saw them growing in the coffee grounds. They didn't really seem to be slower. I didn't personally notice it, but people tell me they're more sluggish. I'm like, that's ironic because you think they make you more stimulated. So I haven't noticed a difference. They do eat it, but the consumption is not at the speed of food waste. It's very slow. And I think the digestion is incomplete, which is why we use it as a substrate. Because if I put a bucket, and that's a five gallon bucket there, I put a bucket of coffee grounds in, it's going to last several weeks as a substrate. They will eat it. It just takes them a long time. So we like that as a refuge substrate for them, but eventually it all gets eaten. So I, I will have to go get maybe three buckets of coffee ground, maybe four for the year. And uh, again, I also use it. If, if the entire thing becomes soup, I use it to um, soak up that extra moisture. You know, some, some food waste, like if you're getting a five gallon bucket of Mugu Guy pan, that's like soupy gel. It's a mess, that food waste. And you need to really balance it off with something that adds porosity and the coffee grounds. This is our four foot it. homestead protopod. We just fed them with some mixed food waste. You'll see the immature cream colored grubs feeding. The bioconversion rate is about 20% mixed food waste. You'll also see a brilliant addition to this generation of pods. What we call the top grub barrier lip prevents them from escaping. Eventually they find the ramps and the mature ones, which are black in color, crawl up and eventually fall out. The harvest shoot and we have a collection bucket below. You could utilize this in any farm setting for fish, chicken, or a few other types of animals. So there's nothing clean about black soldier fly colonies. There's kind of, it's like bees, there's goop everywhere. So this is not like a clean uh, Christmas ornament you got at Tiffany's that's gonna stay pristine. Okay, there's, there's, there's goop and dirt and muck everywhere and you clean it yearly, but just understand, and you saw from the pod that like anything garden, there's dirt and muck and black soldier flies really no exception. Okay, and here is the final video. Uh, this was those, that, that Swiss company at the beginning that it did the one with the two fish. People just wanted to see how fast food waste breaks down. There's no time stamp on this, but let's just say it's fast. This is probably about eight to 10 hours. So they're eating the protein. Everybody knows there's a lot of fat in hamburgers. They're eating that. They love carbohydrates and uh, if you'll notice, there's not a lot of grubs on the, on the surface. Like I said, they're shy of light and they tend to be just below. Sorry, my cat's involved right now with the, the presentation. Um, let's see what's next here. Oh, my contact details. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I don't do this just to make a living. I do this because I love it and I want to make a difference and my the purpose of our company needs to be um, one that actually helps the environment and help everyone. And that's why I kind of settled on this technology because I feel like I'm actually making a positive impact. Um, and I hope everybody got that overview of this species and the benefits through the video. So please reach out again. That's my contact details. I'm not gonna answer a text at 3 a.m., but I will get back to you in the morning. Um, and oh, for those of you who are not really interested in grubs, which that's here, the Green Cone USA is just a compost digester for food waste. 
to break down if you're really up. I, I call it the dump and run um, compost bin for busy professionals who just don't have time to do anything, but still want to reduce their impacts on the climate by diverting all your food waste. Every bit of your food waste can go in the green cone, unlike most compost bins. Um, you can't put everything in the green cone. You can. Any additional questions, Kari? I'm sure we have. Um, some. We've got we've got some thank yous coming in, um, and oh. I will add to that. Thank you so much for telling us about the black soldier flies. Um, I think that they are so cool. Ever since when I first met you and I first learned that these critters even existed, I've been really fascinated by it, and I'm so glad we were able to do this workshop, and so other folks. Can learn about it. Yeah, we've got lots of uh, appreciation in the chat. So, and thank you, Carl. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I know it must have been so hard because it's so beautiful outside. <laughs> so I'm really appreciative that you uh, chose to spend this time with us. Um, I'm going to do a quick plug for our Triangle SciTech Expo, which is the week after next. We have some really awesome, fun virtual programming. So go to the museum's website, naturalsciences.org, to check out some of those. So you'll see a bunch of us there if you've been uh, following our virtual programming. Um, everyone have a fantastic Saturday and a great rest of your weekend. Thank you so much. And